Hello, everyone. This is Mary Larson, Executive Director of the NAM Foundation, coming to you from Summer NAM here live in Nashville, Tennessee. Our great partnership with Intertalk Radio and our Facebook Live podcast with Talking at Music Education. And I'm here today with probably one of my most special people I've come ever had the chance That's to know. Nice to hear. Really, I don't think I I need to make that public declaration. Uh, Bill Ivy who is living here in Nashville now and has a, a really wonderful career in public affairs, public policy. Uh, he was the director, head of the National Endowments for the Arts in the Clinton administration. Yes. He served as the head of the transition team for the Obama administration. Um, he has uh, founded the Curb Center here at, at Vanderbilt, very much involved in cultural entrepreneurship and cultural preservation, an, an author, um, and a, just a beloved thought leader. Thank you, Bill, well, for being with us. Well, thank you for the us. complimentary introduction. Yes, to be with you. well, easy to, to do that. He's also here at Summer NAM to help us with a roundtable event we have this afternoon to uh, have a guilt-free zone about collecting guitars. Yes. We're going to have a conversation with anyone who, who comes into a gentle circle of support realizing that it's okay to collect as many guitars as you want, right? Yes. That's right, in <laughs> which you were yeah. one of them, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I do serial guitar collecting. Right. Although I usually have seven or eight at any given time. Right, and you only can play one to. at a time, let's yes. just face it. But that's that's not what, the, we're going to finally admit a few things and have some fun. So we always start talking at music education with a little bit of music making origin stories. Okay. So was um, we know that you are, have been involved in many aspects of arts and culture, but was music your first thing that you did in, in the artistic side yes. as a musician? And, and where did that training and experience come well, from? Well, I, I had a very interesting, uh, I, I basically learned in the gutter. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I, I was given band, trumpet lessons in a uh, elementary school band when I was eight or nine years old and it didn't take and my family moved all the time and uh, you know it didn't have the continuity mm -hmm. that you need for formal music training but in 1957-58 uh, I was struck as with a bolt of lightning by uh, the Kingston Trio and uh, Tom Dooley and the early part of the folk music revival so I said to my father I have got to have a guitar and he bought me an inexpensive one. It had, I had no way to learn to play it. I could hold it, but I couldn't play it, and there was no one really to teach me. And uh, our family moved to northern Michigan, and a newly acquired friend, Orrin Tikkanen, Finnish-American uh, uh, musician, who's still active up there, he taught me the basics of playing the guitar. So when I say I learned in the gutter, I learned uh, by ear, uh, playing the guitar, at a time when the skill that was most essential was the ability to listen to a recording and figure out what was going on, figure out the chord changes, figure out any melody, and uh, and, and pretty much uh, you know use use your ear to 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 uh, organize your playing. And that actually, as I have matured, I, I consider it to be my only skill. I can, I can, <laughs> I can sit in a room with friends, and uh, someone can sing just about anything, and I can immediately figure out what key they're in, and right. immediately figure out the chord changes. It's D or G or E, yeah, e, right. e major, yeah, and we right. got. I can just you know, finger yeah. those chords. I think we. I think that just was an era that I was trained as a musician, but that's I still did that. I mean, well, you pick up the needle back on the, you know, and they had the LPs, and you really lugged that track, and you just go back and forth and back and forth till that track was worn out more than any, any other track on the LP. But that's how you learn. That's and, how you and, learn. And, and, you know, never underestimate the fact that, that much of being a musician is the ear, is listening. Yes. And, right? and, and, and I became, it, it, and my ear became good enough so that it became very difficult to learn to read because my ear was always ahead of my eye. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I still read very laboriously, even though I've studied music theory and, uh, and, and have worked at it. But guitar is not a great sight reading instrument. Well, and they invented the tablature. Yeah. They invented the tablature that opened up 
the yes. opportunity for you you know it kind of gave permission and then the folklore the the folk music you know movement it was so interesting you mentioned that i know you know the dreadnought guitar everything just there's such a history around it, you know, the entertainment, live music entertainment, acoustic guitar, you know, storytelling, dredg dredging up what happened in small communities everywhere. Now we're getting into, you know, your other part of your professional life being a folklorist, Yes. right? And, and, and I I'm want you to give us a definition of a folklorist. Well, a folklorist, and I tend to say uh, folklore scholar simply yeah. because I, I don't think folklore quite gets what uh, what it, it's about, but folklore scholar or folklorist is somebody who has spent a lot of time studying both the material of traditional culture, that is the songs, uh, stories, jokes, practices, uh, quilt making, the, all the pr all all the elements of expressive life that aren't learned by uh, from books but our past from generation to generation, often face to face in communities. And it's a kind of art making that tends to have very deep connections with heritage and tends to have a very deep connection with community. So the folklore scholar always says, well, this stuff is more important. It tells us more about people than say what novels they're reading because this is homemade culture that's always to a certain extent shared. So. I think folk, folklore scholars over the years have become very adept at, at, uh, at understanding the role of informal culture. And I was, I was intrigued when, when uh, Donald Trump first became president. One of the big comments about him was, well, he's, he's not honoring customs. He's not honoring our traditions. He's not, and, and what those critics were saying was that he's not participating in the informal culture of being a, a, a government elected official leader and, uh, and it's sort of violating these norms. And it, it was a way of showing how important this informal culture really mm -hmm. can be. When my, uh, because of the way I started in music, I developed a passion for traditional music that led to graduate study in the field of folklore. But I also had experience, you know, as an educator myself, we, when, in, as an undergraduate at the University of Michigan, uh, I started frequenting a place called the Herb David Guitar Studio. It was kind of a famous mm -hmm. place in, in Ann Arbor. And Herb had become desperate to find uh, a, you know, somebody to teach beginning guitar. And this was probably 1963, 64. And somewhat to my surprise, there were virtually no, there were no methods. There were, you, you just the the guitar was so the industry had caught up it had not caught yeah, up and so right. i had to make up my own method i i uh, i bought I, I i ordered a batch of uh, uh pete seeger american favorite ballads and oak publication i picked out the six or eight songs that i thought every student would know and i used those and a kind of tablature that i developed myself to teach kids how to play, to do what they wanted to do. They were coming and wanted to play. The stuff uh, they were hearing on the radio. The stuff they were hearing on the radio, yeah. sing, sing along, play with family and friends. And uh, it, it kind of made me into what I would call a low culture snob. <laughs> so, so that if, if you scroll forward to my uh, years as chairman of the NEA, I mean, one of the big, you know, we, had, we, we, all, we were always fighting with what was then MENC. It's since changed its name, but you know, they, because there, the NEA was always trying to provide artist residencies in schools. The MENC w back then was fighting uh, the, the for the qualified certified teacher because it had to be a qualified right. certified right. teacher. And uh, if you if you look at school music even today, you see this very slow, very steady evolution in which what once what was once band music chorus uh, maybe a classical ensemble if you had a bigger school that had the capacity to do that into a much more broad-based much more diverse curriculum yeah and i now think the that guitar that instruction and the yeah the technology it's much more diverse and i think uh, our friends our friends at the music education association have have really evolved with the times that it's an it's not an or proposition it's an and proposition yes that those artist residents really 
uh, do well and better probably when they work with a teacher who is you know, guiding a, a diverse curriculum. Mariachi's in the schools now. Yeah, that's a, Bluegrass yeah. is in the schools. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the whole jazz choir and jazz, on, jazz vocal ensembles. And we just honored um, Manhattan Transfer last night at an, an event here. And I think, you know, the, the, the revolution that, that, they, that they led really as, as popular culture, right? Yes. Yeah. You've, you've, I've given me so many things to talk about, and I, I want to get to something that you just have a brand new book, your third book, Rebuilding an Enlightened World. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. But I wanted to you know, give a little plug out, out there for this. Uh, and all the things that you are, um, um, have contributed to our culture, high, medium, low, homemade. Mm -hmm. But this concept of homemade culture, yes. this really, first of all, I love the term. And what we're hearing now in this, and you've touched, you opened the door about our current administration, and we're going to gent we're going to not, you know, stomp on the threshold here because this is not what this is about. Talking about right. our current political circumstances, but to kind of touch base with that a little bit, when we look at the the complexities of our federal li government now, yes. and the and the tensions there, and you were very much familiar with that being a Washington person as I say we won't hold that against you thank you okay um, that we hear in our media and our writing and journalism and analysis that that it is in direct contrast to the vibrancy that's happening in community yes that the energy that is happening in cities around municipalities homemade culture yeah homemade government, homemade, we're going to build our world. Can you talk a little bit about this? this yeah, there's a, this there's a, a very uh, interesting book by uh, a couple, uh, Jim Fallows and his wife, Deb. They, it's a, it's a, basically a brand new book. It's been out a month or five weeks, and it's called Our Towns. I've and, heard about that. And they basically, yeah. uh, I know him because we're both airplane pilots, and he and Deb flew all, all around the country uh, that's how looking, they did their book tour. That's how they did the book. Well, that's, that's how they, that's how they wrote their book. Oh, they went to all, so they great. visited towns and tr really to try to figure out mostly what's working. A few examples of things that are not working, but mostly what's working. And uh, and they discovered exactly what you uh, observe, which is a, a a real vibrancy in homemade art making and in community development that builds. Uh, uh, you know, builds value for citizens through nurturing expressive lives. And right I, where they are. Yeah, and and yeah. I, and and I, I talked to a folklore scholar, a friend of mine, who's a very prominent, multi-book folklore guy up at Indiana University, Henry Glassy, and he he said that in his experience, he d he did a long research project in Ireland at the time when th the conflict there was really intense. And, and what he said, wha his observation was that when the national government becomes unsettled and, and, and things are uncertain and feel disrupted, people pull into their communities and put more energy into what they can do in a homegrown way, uh, you know, right in town. And, and I think there's an element of that going on now. It's been, this has been happening for a long time, so it's, it's unfair to anyone to say, well, this is some kind of a response to no, I think it's natural. It's, it's it's in the germ. Right? But I but I think that the that there is a lot of uh, of energy at at the community level, and a lot of it, you know, the the, the society where there's a there's something that we're facing, but not talking about, which is as technology uh, kind of overwhelms society, we're going to be losing millions of jobs, and as technology replaces them. As we lose those jobs, citizens who have been told from birth that the way to achieve happiness is through work and wealth are going to have to find another path. Well, you, this was a theme of your earlier that book, was, right? I, I've, I've written about it in Arts, Inc. and in Handmaking America. Just Handmaking was your second book. Second book, Hand, yes. Yeah, that was a powerful book, and, Handmaking in America. Yeah, and, and, and just this I idea that... Uh, we need an alternative way for people to have lives of meaning and purpose. And I think that a vibrant cultural life 
because it connects you with cultural heritage. You know, if you, if you study music, you are studying a great tradition. And it doesn't matter which form of music you pick, you are studying some great tradition. You're also connecting horizontally with community in ways that produce meaning. And, uh, and I think that the arts in general and music in particular are gonna become more and more important as society, as American society is forced to say, it's no longer reasonable. And I don't think it was ever the best way to build a, a life of meaning and purpose, but it's no longer gonna be a, 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 an option available to everybody to think about work and wealth mm -hmm. as the pathway to a successful, high quality life. So uh, I think there are some great opportunities on the frontier for arts leaders. Cultural entrepreneurship. Yeah, and, right? and, and people, who can, <laughs> people who can make the case. But one of my frustrations with my uh, arts colleagues, not so much in music, but just in a general way, is that there's a desperate need for a justification for engagement with art, working with art, learning art, that is not just about oh, if you study art, you'll get better SAT scores. You know, that we, it's we, the instrumental benefits that's of, right. right, we, right. When we have to get beyond that, and I think that there will be that opportunity because uh, there, there will be a casting about. You know, if, if work and wealth is no longer the path, well, what, what do we pursue? Right, what does community connection, a, yeah. neighbor, a vibrant neighborhood, yeah. you know, a vibrant, uh, um, you know, a, a place that's full of, uh, we know that how the food movement has yes. changed communities and, and allowed a pathway for, again, not, you know, in very, very rare exceptions, you know, really significant wealth, but mostly just a really interesting job day to day. Yeah. And a community that cares about, you know, about that, sure. I think. Uh, and a person who can pick up a know. musical instrument, sing a song, and do things that build community value. Uh, through talent and, uh, and and learning, yeah, it gives a, a really important and um, inspiring context for what our NAM members are have been doing for decades in their communities. A small music retail store yes. that serves, and now they're expanding to be live music venues and festivals, and certainly music lessons and a community and and. You know, it's interesting that uh, they are, uh, um, you know, and multi-generational in many ways, and mm -hmm. they've become a, f a fabric part of that, a nucleus for yeah. that. And I, I can ask you a question because I don't, this is something I don't know, but you might know, which is, are our community music stores experiencing something of the revitalization that community bookstores have? I have to say, and this is, I would have to say yes. Yeah. I mean, I think it's represented here in the, uh, in the the strength of the NAM shows, I mean yeah. the the NAM shows have weathered a, a pretty serious recession. Mm -hmm. I mean we adjusted, but we we continued with uh, with the belief, and I think the you see the sustainability. Yeah. You know, in other words, they are they are sustaining with robust. They're sustaining strong businesses, multi. They have employees. It might be two. It might be ten. It might be hundreds. But they're uh, they have consolidated businesses, maybe from multiple shops across the state into yeah. one central place where they can really have their identity and have a hub of activity. Um, so you know, business is uh, business is always challenging, but um, there is so much passion for it. Yes, and there that passion you talk about again uh, a combination. The, the the reason to do it is is deeper. And right. I, I think you know something that uh, that also is so important uh, is that you don't make music without practicing, mm -hmm. and there's a tendency these days for young people to be encouraged to think that well everything you might want to do is on a screen. Why learn to play an instrument? You can just touch something on your iPad or on your phone, mm -hmm. and you'll get a sound. Mm -hmm. You don't really need to learn to play, and and I think that that um, the value the sense of achievement that comes with disciplined study over years, so you do the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours. I think it's still and, about 10,000 hours. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and I think that there's so much, again, to circle back to my point about 
finding a path to meaning and purpose, that's one of the ways to get there. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it's tough right now. This is where, why music education needs to make its point as loudly as possible because there are a lot of pressures out there that saying technology can substitute for everything. And, if it, and everything of meaning can be found on a screen. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and I know that's not true, but uh, there are a lot of forces lined up that we want know us that. to believe that. And I know uh, you, you have to um, be, uh, be assured that the NAM, you know, the NAM organization is, remains on that line mm-hmm. of advocacy for music education. Yeah. And again, we've seen, um, especially in our urban communities, a real reinstatement for, you know, when I think I first got to know you, um, there were no music educators in the city of New York. There yeah, are yeah. now 1,000 certified music teachers yeah. in the city of New York. When I moved to New York, there was the it was there was the pink slip era. Yes. Every arts educator exited the New York City public schools. Um, now the superintendent, the new superintendent, is a mariachi trumpet player, and he came from San Francisco and is a you know is it, that's a pillar of his of his administration now as his new chancellor of of, of uh, education in the New York City public schools. So you know I uh, we've been we're pounding on that drum relentlessly, but it's we we must be vigilant and. Well, I, you know. I, I agree, and I I, I think, um, being optimistic, that in another downturn, I don't think the pink slips would automatically go to mm-hmm. the arts right. part of the education mm-hmm. system. I think that while we're not where we should be, the value of music education and arts learning in general is much more uh, understood right. than it might have been a couple of decades ago. And so maybe maybe we made inroads. I know we made inroads with those instrumental benefits. We got the attention about the value from saying, because, you know, re- reading scores, math scores. Yeah. Now we're doing research about um, a student's sense of efficacy in a school because that program is there, deeper to meaning and purpose. Right. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're growing. Mm-hmm. But, you know, policymakers, they need to see black and white. I know. You know, I'm sorry. But, but I think meaning going- and purpose is, like, really cool, but give me, show me the... So we've built a policy practice, advocacy practice, based on where they are and the decisions are being made. Um, you know, we're talking at 12 o'clock with our coalition on coalitions gathering about the uh, Title IV grant program, the Student Enrich- Success and Enrichment Grant Program, that last year was at 400 million, is at now 1.1 billion, yeah, and is good. all about well-rounded and about school climate, and you know, so we're making we're making headway, and. Yeah. Uh, so, so let's let's end a little bit about talking about rebuilding an enlightened world, knowing that uh, just off the presses by Bill Ivey available Amazon WordPress. Yeah, or in fact, there is a uh, there's a website, www.rebuildingandenlightenedworld.com, okay. and that has a little bit about the book and also places to find it, uh, including local independent. Oh, and you, and my my another person I admire so much in Arizona State. Uh, Stephen, Stephen Depper. Depper. Yeah, I admire him so much. He used to, was at the Curb Center. Yes, right? he and I were colleagues, and yeah. we still talk regularly. But again, but building a very creative higher ed. I know he's doing great. He's got a supportive a, president yeah. at Arizona State. Yeah. They're just doing great things. And but it, rebuilding is really an attempt to f- by m- f- by me to kind of jump the fence a bit and do a book that's really about the current global situation. It has a lot to do about culture, not so much directly about the arts, although they show up in different places, but to really try to assess uh, what's gone wrong and why the global situation and our overall environment here in the U.S. feels so unsettled. And uh, the argument that I make is that the great enlightenment that goes back 200 years, you know, core values of social justice and democracy and individual rights and so on, that it's really threatened. It's really people are pushing back against it and, uh, and that we need to begin again and, uh, and, and rebuild those values in a, in, a, in a new way. So the book tries to get in. It's, it's very, very interesting. I think the last year and a half has generated, gosh, a half dozen or ten 
books about what's wrong. You know, has mm -hmm. liberalism yeah, collapsed? Yeah, we're hearing those are globalization. Those books are being published now. Yeah, the, the thought, right. the th the thinkers and writers had right. a think and write for a, or a year or so, and now they're just reaching the shelves. So, yeah. so this book is an attempt to get into that arena mm -hmm. and uh, and 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 see if my ideas can be there with maybe some uh, more more established, better known public intellectuals. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's always, a, it, this relates to what we were just chatting about. In the U.S. situation, because we don't have a cultural ministry, we've never had kind of that nationalistic approach to culture that France and Germany and other right. countries mm -hmm. have. Because we haven't had a ministry or a Department of Cultural Affairs, the, the cultural world is not seen as a serious part of public policy. And so we're always we, sort of wedging ourselves and we push in. Yeah, right, we're trying. Right. It's like, you know, f well, f so the arts guy writes a public policy book. Well, what does that mean? Is, is he, can he be taken seriously? And it's an interesting uh, challenge for me and maybe a, a, a kind of a challenge to the system to see if my voice can, can get in. I mean, the book's been out for five days so right, well so we'll, as, as our as our president I said we'll see what happens we'll see what happens <laughs> yeah. yeah well we'll see what happens with this book we'll see what happens with this bigger um, you know with the bigger problem of that that we talk about but I think what we can be assured of is that homemade culture is the wave Right. I, and I, maybe, I agree. And, and I that think and that and music and our NAM members and our community of music educators and what they're doing, um, they should be reinforced that yes. what they're doing is important. Yeah. And I think the uh, because this is, you know, this is the we're we're living in the golden age of the guitar. Uh, this is a, a special emphasis for NAM at, mm -hmm. at, at the moment. And I think the guitar is the is the gateway to homegrown, homemade artistry mm -hmm. and uh and, and and in a sense the sky's the limit because mm -hmm. the value of that kind of artistry is only going to increase yeah so maybe now you know why this is one of my favorite people to talk to and well, we could go on and, we on, could go on, and, and on, on and on and yeah. on and have a series and then some of it might only be available to to private audiences because we would talk politics oh, well we got into politics we, a little we, yeah I, I, but I, we I, could I go much deeper yes. but we um but, Bill, thank you so much for joining us here yeah, at Summer NAM, yeah. and good luck with the book. Um, Bill Ivey, Build, Rebuilding an Enlightened World, and the third, of a, uh, the third um, book that he's authored, many articles, many speeches, many conference convenings. This is just among your many activities, and we look forward to seeing you at our, our um, Guitar Collector Anonymous group this afternoon. Yes. And, uh, and to all of you, thank you for joining us. Be sure to share us so people can know that we've had this great discussion with Bill Ivey. Good luck wherever you go in your little airplane. Thank you, Mary. Uh, and all the fun that you have, and we hope to see you soon. And thank you for joining us for Talking at Music Education, a podcast of the NAMM Foundation.